Good morning, Well family. Hi, my name is Caroline Kidd, and I am a Covenant member, as well as a part of the Southwest CG. Yep, they're right over there. And uh, the welcome team. And today I'm going to be reading from Acts 2, 14 through 41. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on the male servants and the female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy." And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hand of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me. For he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh will also dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did he see his flesh corrupt. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses." Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added to that day about 3,000 souls. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Well, Austin. How are you? Good. Hey, so a few weeks ago when I was preaching uh, for Celebration Sunday, Travis assigned me one verse, and today he assigned me like 40, 50 verses. And so being the new guy, I really think he's hazing me. That's what I think is happening today. Hey, it's good to be with you all. It is a joy and an honor to be with you. We're in the fifth week of our series that we're calling Multiply. And if you've been with us, you know we've been walking through the first few chapters in the book of Acts, um, exploring the mission and movement of God. And how that mission and movement of God is multiplying. We want to see how the, the early church, the first church, what they practiced, what they gave their lives to. We want to be a church that practices and gives our lives to as well. And so today, this morning, 
we are talking all about the gospel. And this morning I want us to ask and answer the question, what's so good about the good news of the gospel? Basic question, right? What's so good about the good news of the gospel? Now, before you check out and go, I know the answer, check the box, I've got the t-shirt, all of that. Let me press in just a little bit deeper and ask you this. Are you still captivated by the beauty and the wonder of the gospel? Or has your heart grown dull to the gospel? I think for many of us at times, think of it this way. When you come to... um, your daily scripture reading. Have you ever come to the Bible, open up and your heart just feels a little distant from the scriptures? The the scriptures feel a little cold and dull to you. Guess what? The problem isn't the scriptures. The problem is our heart. And I think the same can happen when it comes to the gospel, that over time we can lose the wonder and beauty of it. And the invitation of the spirit for us today is to recapture and re-see the beauty and glory and hope of the gospel to see what's so good about the good news. Now, I think we use this word gospel all the time here in church and around, and I want to clear up maybe a few misconceptions about what the gospel is. Sometimes when we think about the gospel, we think the gospel is just for skeptics and new Christians, that that the gospel is just a truth to believe. I would say yes and so much more, right? Or sometimes we have this misconception that the gospel is just about how you get to heaven, just a ticket to the afterlife. And yet, the gospel is that and so much more, right? Or we think the gospel is just for once you're saved. It's just a prayer you pray, and then that is it. And I would say the gospel is so much more than that. A few years ago, my friend Kat Armstrong, she was teaching her son the story of the gospel. And I love how Kat described the story of the gospel to her son, her Caleb. She said this, the gospel is God made something good. We messed it up. Jesus makes it right, and then one day Jesus will make all things new. That is the gospel. That is the storyline of it. And one of our distinctives here at The Well is that we want to become a gospel-saturated place and people. And so we say it like this. We say we are a gospel-saturated, everything-type people. We believe the gospel transforms every aspect of our lives. That you cannot outgrow the gospel. That it is the power of God in everything you do. The scriptures consistently show us that Christ is our example and fulfillment of every portion of scripture and then calls us to live this truth out. And I think for that to happen, we have to keep the good news of the gospel at the center of our lives and the center of us as a church, right? Think about this. One of the most repeated scriptures uh, and one of the most repeated commands in all of the Bible is the command to remember. Why? Why? Because you and I, we are prone to forget what is true about God and ourselves. And consistently the scriptures say, remember, 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 because we leak God's vision and heart for us. We need to remind ourselves what is true. And so Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up among the crowd. The crowd thinks these guys are drunk because they're speaking in other language. People are hearing the gospel in their heart and home language. And so Peter stands up and he begins to preach. And he begins by quoting Joel chapter 2. Right? This is the same passage that Tori led us through at the beginning of this year. That, that Tori says, a church we believe is God is moving in us to replant and to restore us. That Joel 2 is about God's promise to restore what was lost and broken. That one day God would do a brand new work, a new movement of his spirit, and he would bring about redemption and restoration. And here Peter applies Joel 2 to Acts chapter 2. And what's remarkable, I think, about Peter's sermon is Peter says God in Joel 2 is elevating those who in the ancient world would be forgotten and marginalized. If you and I were to travel back into the ancient Near Eastern world and the nation surrounding Israel, what we would find is that the young, the old, women, the foreigner, and the stranger were often neglected, mistreated, and ignored. Right? Look what uh, Peter says in verse 17. He says, In those last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit 
on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Peter's saying that in Christ, God is doing something new by the power of the spirit. That both sons and daughters, young men and old men, servants and women, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Peter is essentially saying, the spirit is for all people who believe, not just select people. Because all people are made in the image of God. This is what theologians call the imago Dei. Right? To be made in the image of God means that you've been created with an inherent dignity, worth, and value. That according to Genesis 1, you have an unmatched dignity within all of creation. Out of everything made by God, human beings alone are said to be made in the image of God. Yeah. And that there's nothing you can do to make him love you more or less because you are made in the image of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are made in the image of God. No, no, no. Say it like you mean it. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are made in the image of God. There we go. There we go. And Peter says the gospel is good news for all people because all people are made in the image of God. A few years ago, my wife and I, Tiffany, we were um, heading to the mountains of Colorado. We believe uh, Colorado is our happy place. We love to go there in the summer to escape the Texas heat and to just go hiking. That's our happy place. We love doing that. And so um, we decided to go to the mountains. I think uh, God created two kinds of people in the world. He created uh, mountain people and he created beach people. And we're not beach people. And I know some of you are looking at me right now are like, you're not even a sunlight person, right? <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I hear that. I receive that. And so we decided to go to the mountains of Colorado. And this was one of those vacations where we just want to completely unplug, check out, and just be present with God and in nature. And we, where we had this little Airbnb nestled right up to the mountains, this little bitty cabin that had this rooftop balcony. You know what I'm talking about? And I remember, I think it was the first or second night there, I go up to the rooftop balcony and I look up and I just see the stars on display. It's like someone flipped a light switch and you could see the starry night sky, right? Psalm 19 even talks about this, that the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. It was just breathtaking. Imagine with me, the most majestic mountains you've ever seen or the brightest stars you've ever seen or the most beautiful sunset. Imagine in your mind right now the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in all of God's creation. Do you have something in mind? None of those things bear the same kind of glory, the same kind of beauty as the person sitting next to you right now, because none of those things are said to be made in the image of God. That the truest thing about you this morning is that you are made in his image, that he loves you and he sees you and he's made you with dignity, worth, and value. And you need to let that truth be tattooed onto your soul this morning. Friends, some of you are chasing after things, hoping it will give you value and dignity and beauty. And guess what? It is just an empty promise you were chasing after. That dream job you think will make your life complete, it won't. That guy you're chasing after in the office, he won't. Don't chase after something that wants to rob you of joy in Christ, that you are made in the image of God, that you have worth, value, and dignity. And Peter says here in Joel 2 that the gospel is good news for all people who believe because all people have been made in the image of God. Women and men, young and old, no matter your background or your story, the gospel is good news for you today. That your biggest sin and your greatest regret does not define you. The gospel defines you. Christ's identity defines you. That you have the spirit living inside of you if you believe in Jesus. 
that you are marked by the Spirit, not your last regret, that the enemy wants to remind you of your past and the Spirit wants to point you to the cross where Jesus dealt with your past, your present, and your future. You are made in the image of God and the gospel is for all people who believe. All people who believe. So what what makes the gospel good news? It's for all people who believe. It's also about King Jesus and his work on our behalf. Think about this. If you were to start a worldwide movement to change the entire course of human history, how would you go about starting that? You'd probably want to have um, a really good uh, communications and marketing person on your team, right? You probably want to have a few TikTok videos. That's what I hear. Um, you probably need to pay a social influencer. You need a, a good financial planner. You need some swag, right? That's how you'd go about starting a worldwide movement. What does Peter do? This is the first sermon in the entire history of the church. And how does Peter go about this? You know what he does? He preaches about the cross and the empty grave of Christ, period, full stop. That's what Peter does. You want to change the world? Preach Christ crucified. You want to see your neighborhood and your apartment complex change for the glory of God? Preach Christ crucified. You want to see new life in your friends? Preach Christ crucified. That what the world calls foolish, God uses to magnify his name. Paul in 1 Corinthians says this, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong, right? Peter says this in verse 22, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which he did among you through him. uh, This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Amen? Then jumping down in verse 32, it says this, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted at the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promise of the Spirit has been poured out to you now that what you see and hear. This is the good news of the gospel. That I think when you look to Jesus at the cross, you see two things. You see the scandal of your sin and you see the scandal of his love. That I think we live in a cultural moment where it feels like the word scandal has become kind of pedestrian, Right? That every time we we check the news or Facebook or whatever, there's another news story about another scandal breaking. That we've actually grown accustomed to scandals. But simply put, the word scandal is something that is both outrageous and remarkable. Outrageous and worth remarking about. And at the cross, we see the scandal of our sin and the scandal of his love, that we live in a sin-scarred world and we are a sin-sick people. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a sinner. No, no, again, like we believe it because it's true. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a sinner. Now, I just heard someone over here say, I know you're a sinner. They took way too much joy and pride in that one. I see you over there, right? That we are a sin-sick people. Theologians talk about this as depravity. Depravity does not mean as we are as bad as we could be. It means from the top of our head to the tips of our toes, we have this inward bent towards sinning. Uh, St. Augustine in the fourth century, a pastor in North Africa, he said that we are the being curved in upon ourselves. What that means is that we like to make life all about us. Right? That we seek to live for project self. Rich Villadas says it this way. Sin is not just something we do, but a power humanity is under. We can't educate ourselves out of its grip. We don't overcome it through progressive achievements or by moral consistency. The antidote for sin is found in a power outside of ourselves. Yeah. The cross of Christ. That when you look At Jesus at the cross, you see the scandal of your sin that Peter says that Jesus took upon himself the weight and curse and ugliness of our sin that separates us from God. 
that he took upon himself the worst that humanity has to offer, that he became our substitute on the cross. Centuries before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah wrote a poem describing the suffering servant who would come to bring healing by taking the weight of our sin and shame. And Isaiah 53 says this, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. That when you look at Jesus on the cross, you see the scandal of your sin. But I think you also see the scandalous love of God on display. Think back to Celebration Sunday. Just, just, just two weekends ago, right? And we heard testimony, testimonies of our sisters and brothers in faith proclaiming faith in Christ in baptism. Here's just what a few of our sisters and brothers said. One girl said this, I started to realize that no amount of accomplishments were going to fill the longing in my heart. And I found new freedom in my identity in Christ. It wasn't about my image being liked. Jesus taught me that my shame no longer defines me. That my sin points me to the feet of Jesus where there is grace. Can we get an amen? Amen. Someone else said this, God has tenderly shown me that I don't have to unburden or collect myself to come to Jesus. That our very burden is what qualifies us to come to Jesus. Can we get an amen? One other person said this, Jesus saw me and he sought me in my loneliness, in my emptiness, and in my seeking. Jesus made known to me that he was with me and that he loved me, and that I was worthy of being loved. Amen? Amen. The scandalous love of God. It's outrageous and it's remarkable. The prophet Isaiah continues, punishment that was brought, his punishment brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Family, this is the gospel, the good news about Jesus, that he bears our sin and shame. And at the cross, we see the scandalous love of God. Do you believe it today? Dane Ortland, in his book, Gentle and Lowly, says this, Jesus does not love like us. We love until we are betrayed. Jesus continued to the cross despite betrayal. We love until we are forsaken. Jesus loved through forsakenness. We love up to a limit. He loves to the very end. Orland goes on, that God is rich in mercy means that your regions of deepest shame and regret are not hotels through which divine mercy passes, but homes in which divine mercy abides. It means that the things about you that make you cringe the most Make him hug the hardest. It means that his mercy is not calculating and cautious like ours. It is unrestrained, flood-like, sweeping, magnanimous. It means that our haunting shame is not a problem for him, but the very thing he loves to work with the most. It means that our sins does not cause his love to take a hit. Our sins cause his love to surge forward all the more. At the cross, we see our sin and our Savior's love. And Peter doesn't just stop at the cross. He preaches the empty tomb of Christ. Going back to verse 24, he says, But God had raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. As a pastor, I've officiated, unfortunately, many, many funerals. And I count it a sacred honor to stand before families stand between the living and the dead and to proclaim the gospel, the hope of the resurrection, and to remind grieving families of what is true about God in their midst of grief, pain, and sorrow. But there is one funeral I will never forget. And it was the funeral for my own son who passed away in 2018. And I remember as I walked into that church, for my son's funeral, I, as a pastor, needed to be reminded of what is true. That death and sadness and grief and anger at God all overwhelmed me in that moment and in that season. And what my heart needed most 
was to hear the gospel. It was not just about the death of Christ, but the hope of our risen Christ. That, right, what Jesus has done for us in the past secures for us what he will one day do for us in the future. That there is coming a day when one day God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more pain and suffering. That one day God will come back and he will make all things right, family. And on that day, I need to be reminded of what was true. And maybe you are here today and you need to be reminded of what is true as well that I know in a room this size, there are some of you who are navigating health issues. And that's weighing heavy on your heart and mind. I know others of you, you're waiting for the results of that last scan. Saying, Lord, what's it gonna show? Others of you, maybe it's your parents' health or a friend or a coworker, or maybe you're watching a friend go through a difficult situation. You're hurting for him or her. Or maybe it's something at work. Saints, Don't let your circumstances dictate your view of God and his love for you. The God who raised Jesus from the dead is the one who is with you and at work in your life even now. Even when you can't see it or feel it, he is there. And if death can't keep its hold on Jesus, then the enemy and sin can't keep their hold on you, church family. That God is at work in you doing something. That same, the same God who raised Christ from the dead, the power of his spirit is at work in you today. The Lord is faithful and good, even when it's hard to see or feel. Trust him. Have faith, family. Believe in him. That as a church, we are not people of the grave. We are people of the empty tomb. That we are Easter people. We believe that God can do the impossible believing that God wants to use us to push back darkness in the city of Austin, believe that God wants to use us to bring light and love and flourishing and hope to the people and places around us, that God has placed you where you are because he wants to use you to preach Christ crucified in the empty tomb to the people and places around you. When I first got here, I remember Tori telling me that um, if every church in the city of Austin was full to the max, running as many services as they could, that would only fill uh, 14% of Austin. That only 14% of Austin embraces faith in Christ. Guys, the need to hear the gospel is real, right? There are men and women in our city and around the nations that need to hear Christ crucified, Christ risen from the grave because there is hope in the gospel. Right? That's why we do this idea of one place, choosing one place to pray for, to visit frequently, to build relationships and connections with. This is why we create CGs where we invite friends and neighbors and friends to come in and hear the goodness of the gospel, that we ourselves can walk into CGs and be reminded of what is true and good because our hearts forget the gospel. We need to be reminded of what is true. Right? Look at verse 36, what Peter says next. I can turn the page. It's a little sticky. Let's do this. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit, right? It says that they were cut to the heart. I don't know about you, but when I go, like, go running or jogging, you get that little side stitch right here. That's not what this is. Maybe it's just me being out of shape, right? That's not what's happening. This word here it means this emotional stab of pain, right? That they were stung by the preaching of Peter and the convicting power of the Spirit, right? This is the same crowd that was shouting, crucify Christ, Just weeks earlier, they're shouting, we don't have anything to do with Jesus. And here, they're cut to the heart. They're cut to the heart. And they're cut to the heart by the Spirit and by Peter. And what I find absolutely remarkable is Peter proclaiming the gospel, right? Um, Have you looked at Peter's resume lately? 
Uh, I don't know about you, maybe, you've, maybe you're in a job or you look at a lot of resumes and figure out what candidates to hire. Let me, um, let me just give you Peter's resume, if I can do that for a second off of LinkedIn. Cool? So uh, Peter, according to the scriptures, he was a fisherman who dropped out of rabbi school. Uh, he's a self-promoter, which is cool, but he's quick to speak and slow to listen. I think that's the exact opposite of Proverbs, right? He was once called Satan by Jesus. That'll make you stand out, right? Uh, he has a tendency to cut people's ears off when provoked. Not great. Uh, has trouble telling the truth. Denied Jesus a few times. Uh, can't swim and doubted Jesus. And here's this. Some of you got that a little slow this morning. Peter struggled with feelings of racial and cultural superiority, according to Galatians 2. Here's my point. You are more like Peter than you care to admit. And I am more like Peter than I care to admit. Rich Villadas says it this way. If Jesus spent eight hours a day, every day, for three years with his disciples, he would have spent over 8,000 hours with them. And after all that time, they still had major gaps. You have gaps. I have gaps. We all have gaps that need sanctification. I'm in a season of life with a two-year-old. They call it terrible twos, and I think that is a very generous description <laughs> of that season of life, right? Uh, my patient's gas tank runs empty with that lovely girl. Uh, I come home after a long day at work, and the last thing I want to do is have to debate with a two-year-old why we're not having goldfish crackers for dinner. Now get me, I, I love goldfish crackers. I am all for that. But we just can't have that for dinner, right? My patience tank runs low that I need the gospel to sanctify me in the area of patience, right? You never graduate from the gospel. You never arrive when it comes to Jesus. That the gospel is not just a decision you make or a set of truths to believe. The gospel is a new reality to live into. That the gospel should shape every area of the Christian's life because we believe all of life centers around Jesus and the cross and the grave. Right? That here at the well, we teach this as a distinctive in our covenant community class. We say it this way. Everything centers around the person and work of Jesus. We try to highlight, direct our attention to, and represent the worthiness of Christ in everything we do. We think that all of Scripture tries to shift our attention to Him. That He is where we find every longing in our heart fulfilled. That what Christ accomplishes on the cross, we believe the Spirit applies to our lives today. That Christ gives us his power to walk in. Do you believe it? Right? The Spirit reveals God's word to us. It empowers us for witness and ministry, equips us with spiritual gifts, convicts us of sin, helps us to kill sin in our lives, and leads us to becoming more like Jesus. This is the work of Spirit. This is the work of the Spirit in our lives. And the gospel is not just something you believe. It's a reality that should shape every aspect of your life. Uh, this past weekend, I officiated a wedding or a wedding vow renewal ceremony for this sweet, sweet couple here at the well. And anytime I, I do a wedding, I like to give uh, the couples just three or four very practical words that they can apply in their marriage and also to connect the dots of those very practical words to the gospel. Because I know in a room with a wedding, there might be men and women who do not know the gospel. I want to proclaim the gospel at a wedding. And so for this couple, I gave them just four simple words. The words of, of faithfulness, sacrifice, grace, and hope. And I talked about how those four words give shape to a healthy marriage and are at the core of the gospel that we want to be faithful in our relationships to one another because Jesus has been so faithful to us, right? That we want to be women and men who extend grace and receive grace when we wrong one another because Jesus extends grace to us even while we were still sinners. We want to live sacrificial lives in relationships. We're going to go, go out of our way and do the dishes and take the trash out, right? Because Jesus lived a perfect life self-giving, sacrificial life 
for us, right? The gospel should shape every area of our lives. So I just want to end with this. When it comes to relationships, dating, marriage, sexuality, finances, parenting, friendships, career and vocation, how are you allowing the truth and the beauty of the gospel to shape those areas? Is there an area of your life you're saying, Jesus, you can have these, but don't touch this over here. That's mine. Jesus says, I died for that. I died so you can walk in freedom and new life and hope and mercy. Give that to me. He wants to receive that. How are you allowing the hope of the gospel to shape every area of your life? I just want to end with this just with a few applications. Some of you in the room, you're not sure about Jesus. You're wondering if he's real, if he exists. I think the invitation for you is to believe the gospel. Believe the reality of your sin that separates you from God. Believe the reality of his love for you, that on the cross he died for you and rose that you might have new life. For those of you in the room, you've never placed your faith in Christ. Our prayer, my prayer, is that you would do that today. Believe in Jesus. For others of us, maybe we need to meditate on the gospel daily, that maybe our heart has grown cold to the beauty and reality of the gospel. Remind your heart of what is true by meditating daily on Christ, on his goodness, on his love, and his sacrifice for you. Others, maybe ask the Spirit to empower you that you can walk in the new reality that the gospel has made for you. And then finally, for others of us, maybe we need to share the gospel. Maybe there's that neighbor, that coworker, that the Lord has been placing on your heart. And every time you see he, him or her, the Spirit just pings you. Maybe this is the week you share your, gospel, share your story and the gospel with someone. Let's pray. Father, you were good and you were gracious. And we see your goodness and your grace on display in the Lord Jesus and at the cross. So Lord, we thank you that we can have new life, that we can experience forgiveness and freedom through the atoning work, the sacrificial work of your son. That the gospel is good news because it's for all people. That the gospel is about King Jesus and what he's done on our behalf. And that the gospel is for our daily discipleship. Lord, we thank you. We praise you because you alone are good and worthy. Remind our hearts what is true this morning as we worship and take communion. In Christ's name we pray, amen.